Hello, friends, and welcome to World Build With Us, the podcast where we create fantastical worlds with help from you, our listeners. My name is Rob Hilferty, and I'm here with my co-hosts, Courtney Staples and C.R. Rowenson. On today's episode, we are finishing up our Sky of a Thousand Trade Win series, which was initially brought to us by our listener, Axel. So a big thank you again to Axel. And remember that if you want us to build your world, you can always go to our website, worldbuildwithus.com, click on the link, follow some instructions, and within a reasonable amount of time, we'll be building your world. If you want to follow us on social media, we're over on Twitter at Let's World Build. If you want to come join our Discord and talk about trade wins and atmospheres, by all means, you can click the link and sign in and chat with us on Discord. And of course, if you're feeling particularly generous, you can always go to our Patreon where you can give us money and get access to our sweet, sweet patron-only episodes, early episodes, and behind-the-scenes stuff that we offer occasionally. With all that shilling out of the way, we're going to jump right back into the series where we left off, which was the twist, of course. And our twist this time was, now add in some undead, which I'm very excited about. (laughs) And normally I allow my co-hosts to start off and tell us what they think, but I don't care this time. So (laughs) I'm going to go ahead and start us off. And when they said some undead... I was like, that's not enough undead, actually. (laughs) So I've decided that the primary living species in this region are undead. Hmm. It allows us to get around and over and through some, you know, like resource restraints that would otherwise like make living in this type of world completely untenable. And that's even with Clark's like profound scientific knowledge, right? So that's where I want to start us off today. Uh, uh, Not everyone, but the primary folks who live in this region are undead. How bad does that fuck up your tenant, Clark? Go ahead and start us off again. Uh, Pretty bad. Uh. (laughs) Yes, that's what I want to hear. I think we can make this work. But one of the things I was thinking about is I know like there was a spot earlier in the in the last episode that I mentioned I wanted this to be kind of science fiction. Yes. I want to sort of readdress that one because I don't think science fiction is the right term. I just wanted it to be more rational with more Mm science explanations Mm -hmm. behind the stuff. Especially now that we're dealing with undead and the version of undead that I want to pull in. Like true sci-fi, unless you're going really far sci-fi, is kind of out of the question. Unless you're dealing with like ascended beings. Because um, I, I guess at this point I want to add an additional type of undead where they <laughs> through the process of treating their dead they unleash um i was i was looking up vapor and gas words and i, I stumbled on miasma so a great word by it's the such way. a good word so i was thinking that while they treat their dead or their second dead whatever people who are in true death or even when they go from their normal life to their first death whatever the process of treating the dead unleashes their their essence into the world winds and Ooh. miasma specifically are supposed to be like malodorous, um, bad smelling mm-hmm. and poisonous. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the idea I had there is that some people, when their essence leaches mm-hmm. out, it is a miasma and you can smell it. And these people are rotten and they are what ends up floating through, through the world and possessing things and creating mm-hmm. malevolent undead. Mm-hmm. Whereas the more mm-hmm. benevolent um, essences that are floating around are just part of the trade winds and might be some very interesting like ancestor type worship stuff that could even Ooh. aid in navigation and do all kinds of weird fun things that way so that's very cool that that was my whole take on the undead in this world that is very i cool, mean yeah. i i think that's works remarkably well with what we're dealing with here i, I think right like i i don't think that there's any reason why we can't have that in our world at all right yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, I could see it fitting in very well. And I, I do agree that it does add this interesting, like, mystical, spiritual element to the world that we were kind of lacking before. Mm-hmm. One thing I'm kind of interested in now is um, I know that we said, or, or hell, I said last episode that I wanted this to be like a region or like a larger mm-hmm. region. One thing I'm kind of interested in now, especially with Clark's kind of miasmic beings, is Okay, we've got people who are coming in and they're essentially 
being dropped up. Is this like just a giant elephant graveyard? Is this the place where everyone, like every other nation drops their dead as like some kind of a ritual or a practice or something like that? I like that. I I think it'd be really cool, right? Like it's okay. We have, we have the bodies of the dead. We're dropping them off. And in some cases you're literally revitalizing them. So they, they live again. In other cases, their spirit just becomes this, miasmic cloud that possesses other people like i think this is something that we could really make interesting like you're essentially by dropping them off here you're offering them a chance at a second life right yeah Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. what also makes sense about this is if the other people from all around the world see this land as unlivable then of course that's where they would go to drop off their dead because it just makes sense to them yeah yeah that's true given that it is like a, a magma sandstorm hellscape yeah uh it does yeah. make sense that it actually wouldn't be inhabited by living people mm-hmm. i love that because that also lets us meld at least the two tenets we have about the undead so far because now when you die and you go through the process like people are going to come out across a spectrum right they're the truly mm-hmm. benevolent ones that end up like merging with the trade winds and so they're interacting with the rest of the world Mm-hmm. And probably doing things to help their original clan, their original people when they can. Mm-hmm. Potentially, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then like the the bad and the neutral ones are all dumped here. So the bad to neutral ones are the ones that have reanimated their bodies and are, are wandering around just trying to live their best lives as their best mm-hmm. second lives in, in this place. I don't, I don't know. I think that's super cool. It, it is super cool. And I'm also thinking about this with the original tenets in mind as well. And I'm thinking of themes of community. Mm-hmm. And this absolutely fits into the theme of community. And if you don't believe that, then I disagree with you entirely. But um, I think that this works really, really well here. Because what it also allows uh, this nation or this this kind of continent to do is have an industry within the dead. Like, yeah. pay us and we'll come pick up your dead. We'll take care of them. We'll give them whatever proper religious rights. Bring and then guess what? Yeah, yeah exactly right. what I was <laughs> like, actually. But then at the same time, that's a boon for them as well, because they're essentially growing their population by doing so. Oh, I so love there's that. this mm-hmm. kind of like, not cyclical, but there's this transaction that happens and it works out for both parties. Yeah. And Obviously, if this happens long enough, then there's going to be some xenophobia where it's like, oh, there's an entire nation of undead folks that we really need to go and snuff out, you know, because mm-hmm. that's where right. suddenly it's like they're eating our dead. You know, they're 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 doing bad things to our dead. Right. And of course, right. that there adds to like this cultural stigma as well, which I think yeah. can be really interesting. Right. And mm-hmm. there could be some really fun there because we talked about there being seasonal storms and seasonal surges yeah. to the trade mm-hmm. winds because mm-hmm. then there could be all of these omens of like oh no the storm is approaching and that means the dead come after that's cool that's, that's like very, very literally yeah. like now the now the dead are coming across the ocean in their ships mm-hmm. and we hand them our dead and they move on yeah, yeah yeah that that's such a cool idea oh man yeah yeah love that uh, of course, you can also like look at storms from other perspectives and be like, oh, oh, that's that is an angry storm. And right. instead of that having like, oh, we're personifying nature, it's like, no, literally. those spirits are <laughs> literally, literally angry at us. Pissed off at every, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So we can have that really cool aspect as well. Mm-hmm. So that's fun. That's mm-hmm. really fun. I love that. And yeah. those kinds of storms would reek. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so before we get into Courtney's, uh, reconciliation with Mm -hmm. the twist, I just want to point out that what we've created are undead sky pirates potentially. Yep. And I just want to say that that's really cool. So agreed. (laughs) Yeah. So so Courtney, hit us with with your reconciliation. What are we working with here? We've already got these cool ideas. So please, how are we approaching undead from your angle? All right, so I had more of a focus on uh, creatures mm-hmm. in this because last episode we talked about the petroglyphs in this land that we sure did huge creatures and and also about the bones uh, that people use for construction mm-hmm. and all sorts of things. When you say that, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm sorry to interrupt, but when you say it like that, I I feel like you're not saying it right, like. When you say, oh, the bones, it's like you've got to say it with like a mad scientist, or like the bones, you know, like that. 
that's how I'm approaching this, but I, I, mm. I apologize. By all means, continue. No, I, I do have Monty Python on the mind now, so I was yeah. just like, look at the yeah. bone. Yes. <laughs> We've got Sorry. to get the bone. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 it's out of my system. I I would have exploded and died on the podcast, and I apologize. Can Same. I was right behind you. <laughs> um. Yeah. So my idea is that for some reason these creatures themselves are starting to revive and emerge mm. from the lava fields. These like massive Ooh, yes. mythical creatures. Mm-hmm. Um. I don't know why that is. Maybe it's just. The concentration of the undead spirits is what's leading to that over mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. Um, or if it's like a natural thing that's supposed to happen just over the course of millennia or mm-hmm. necromancy or science or who knows. What do you guys think? I immediately have an idea. Mm-hmm. I have so many ideas. <laughs> so many ideas. Yes. I, I'm immediately thinking that, you know, Clark has this idea that there is this miasma and then there's the good version, which is in the trade wind. And I imagine that there's going to be like literal lost souls of the dead yeah. that kind of like break away from these maelstroms and they just kind of settle within the earth. And some of them end up settling in bones because they find comfort in something that is familiar. And eventually what ends up happening is that these skeletons and eventually, you know, of these massive behemoths eventually become massive conglomerates of a bunch of wayward souls that kind of get lost. And eventually they gain like a hive mind sentience and they're like fairly mindless. They're not like an intelligent collective, but it's more like, Hey, we have ambulatory movement now guys. Like just because there's so many of us, we have the power to move these ancient bones and start walking around. Uh, So like having giant undead behemoths that are just like, slowly ambling you know like you watch them like walk across the magma or the lava rather Mm -hmm. like i think that's a really cool evocative image but i don't want to monopolize the idea so clark what did you think when it comes to all the million ideas that we have about this i mean that that core part was very close the main thing i was going to say is we've done a very good job so far keeping it fairly lighthearted. so i was gonna restrain myself from all of the incredible agglomeration body horror potential that we have here <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, so cool. and just and just focus on I, I like the idea of that i do also like the idea of there being fossilized megafauna mm-hmm. that they mm-hmm. end up mm-hmm. animating right i would push back and say that fossilized suggests that the bones are no longer there that there's some kind of a stone, right? Because that's what fossilization right. happens. So the the reason I went with fossilized is it seemed like that would survive the lava a little better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what I was thinking mm-hmm. too. Was the main reason I was thinking that. But yeah, yeah. so it. But would if be we're weird... dealing with megafauna, like we can just hand wave that away and say like these beasts are designed to withstand the lava, right? Like we Fair. can just make that argument, and you know, science it away or or magic it away and just kind of hand wave it, which. As you all know, I'm very mm-hmm. in favor of, you know, because it's a rule of cool for me, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I love that. And I, and I love just all of the cross and blend where, like, most of trade winds are mostly the benevolent ones, but not mm-hmm. entirely. And it could be the same the other way, right? So that you do have yeah. the occasional, like, wandering monster that will stop and help travelers and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, concept for you, Clark. Uh, there are trade winds and then the miasmic ones that you're talking about are the dead winds, which are, Mm. does that make sense as like a name? It's ominous, spooky. It suggests something bad. Does that work for you? Oh, it absolutely does. I just, uh, my main thing is I, I don't want it to just be a specific band. Like you can have a specific band that is always like always considered the dead winds. Mm-hmm. But I do like the idea of dead wind incursions into the different yes. areas mm-hmm. as these kind yeah. of storms. And, yeah. and, and I, I fully support that. I think that having the dead winds be something that aren't something that are reliable is is fun. And it makes sense as a counterpoint to something like trade winds, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that will be <laughs> if, if you wanted to play in this world as the undead, that would be a really interesting thing because everybody associates you with the dead winds. And you're mm-hmm. like, we're not. That's not even remotely right. the same. <laughs> and I'm glad that you bring that up because I do want to come back and talk about community because I feel like as, as it was part of the tenets originally within the prompt, I want to, I want to kind of drill down into this concept a little bit more because these spirits, right. Or, or these undead 
are they new people or are they the same people reanimated? Because I think that if we have this as it is right now, uh, bringing a bunch of people who have died and come back and like putting them all in one place forces a community. But it also, I'm afraid what might happen is you'll, you're going to get like clans that are far more segregated because I remember being from this area when I was alive, I want to find other people like that. So mm-hmm. if we could strip away part of that, I think, I think that would be yeah. Really yeah. interesting. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Like when they die, they lose some, something in them that had cared about that previously. Mm-hmm. And like maybe even just the process of dying is like, wow, like none of that fucking mattered. Like who mm-hmm. cares? Mm-hmm. We're all just kind of the same. We're the same bones underneath. Right. Um, so nationalities don't really matter uh, in the afterlife. Mm. Mm. Could also be that like the core personality is preserved, right? In this process of mm-hmm. uh, releasing the essence, but like specific memories and details could be fragmented and fractured and lost. So, mm. you know, yeah. like, yeah, I was alive. I remember these kinds of relationships. I might remember a name or two. These symbols are familiar, but. I don't have cohesive enough memories to be like, oh, these were the bad guys. These were the good guys. It's just like they were important and they frightened me. This was comforting. Mm -hmm. And that's all I've got. I think I've got a way to square this. And it makes sense lore wise within the world that we've created. So we've got the dead winds. We've got the trade winds. And those are conglomerates of like essences, right? Of of spirits and even partially soul stuff, right? That's kind of Mm -hmm. established the uh, lore, right? Yeah. Okay. So how about that? Like there's a process that happens that the essence is removed from the corpse and whatever's left is just what that person is. Right. So for example, like this process doesn't strip the entirety of the being from the body, but rather just aspects of it. So Mm -hmm. follow me on this one. Let's say that we have a raging bigot right? We have a xenophobe, we have a nationalist, and then their body is dropped and stripped away of all the evil. And that evil goes and joins a miasmid, goes and joins a dead wind, right? What's left are the good concepts within that person. So community building is not evil, Right. But right. When it's community building from a nationalistic standpoint, it is so that that corpse rises and it's like, I want to build a community. I want to be good because the evil was ripped away and thrown into a dead wind or something like that. OK, so that's kind of the concept mm-hmm. that I want to run with is whatever's remaining of the body. And, and I would like to think that when this process happens, it's not really choosy. It just happens to the body. It doesn't take a hero and take all the good things out necessarily. It just, the process happens to the body and then the body rises. So right. it could mm-hmm. rise as a hero again. It could rise as all of the vainglorious evil things that were left behind as its heroism mm-hmm. was stripped from it, you know? Maybe it even has to do with uh, which trade winds or dead winds are like kind of going over the area at that time. Sure. Like if there's a, yeah. a mass dead winds going, it's going to soak up all the evil stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but vice versa. Yeah, that's, that could definitely work. That's super cool. And what I really love about this is we now have a a pseudo physical manifestation of something similar to the Nirvana cycle, mm-hmm. but not mm-hmm. not quite. Because you go through your life trying to be the best person you can be with the idea of joining the trade winds. Obviously, this is just one religion and what would be right. a complex world. Mm-hmm. But you're trying to be the best person you can so that when you die, your essence immediately goes to the trade winds. If you're not, then you get your second life either the good is stripped away or the bad is stripped away. And then Mm. you are part of the remaining and your second life is your second chance to achieve this. That's cool. And of course there are some people who are going to look at that and be like, no, fuck that. I don't care about that. Right. Right. That, and that's really fun because you still have all like the, the fun kind of like, and these people, as they rise again, they're still trying to relearn who they are. Yeah. And that to me is really fascinating, like kind of figuring out all those things that I was. That's really, really cool. Mm -hmm. And as as a side note, I think that's part of the reason that we like amnesia stories so much is because you can Mm -hmm. then have somebody who is fresh and relearning and processing things like a child and teenager does, but Mm -hmm. with Mm -hmm. the 
knowledge, articulation, and understanding of an adult. I think that's part of the reason yes. we really like yeah, amnesia stories sense. in general. Yeah. yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. No, this is cool. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I I'm really <laughs> loving how this is coming together. Mm-hmm. And Me I too. feel like we did a great job of really reconciling with all of our uh, with, with with all our points. I think that we've nailed it, right? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, everybody's mm. plays a big role, and I'm interested to see how this goes with the factions too. <laughs> yeah, and we we did a little bit something different last episode. I instead of us bringing in factions that are perhaps nation or region wide, I decided that what I wanted us to focus on this time was to focus on the cities themselves and you know what their petroglyph city looked like and what it symbolized and how that expresses itself through the city's culture, uh, among other things, because I thought that that'd be a really fun way to kind of approach our normal factions. So this time, Courtney, why don't you start us off? Because the petroglyphs were definitely your Mm -hmm. uh, tenant from last session. So why don't you start us off and tell us about your petroglyph city? Sure. Um, I am going to have to do some uh some work to make it fit with the twists that we brought in mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. i think it'll come together or are they all, all like farmers or something like that Not, no no okay, okay you'll see uh, so i had initially been thinking of something cool and thematic like a phoenix or a lava serpent you know uh-huh. something sweet but uh then decided to go with a giant lava toad because you know why not <laughs> um, okay and uh, one of the traits of toads is that they're all poisonous to some extent. They all have these yes. glands that secrete toxins for defensive purposes. So I'm picturing the city as very defensive, um, probably not the most attractive from the outside, but heavily built up with strong materials um, and also with natural poison gas vents that they've kind of constructed lids over mm. to control the spread of the gas. Oh. Uh, so my idea is that if they're under threat, they could open up the vents and create basically walls of poison so that like enemy hot air balloons can't get by. That's great. not totally sure how it's going to work with everybody's undead, but we can figure it out. Well, <laughs> I think what we would do if that case, instead of just making it like poisonous to like living things, why not just make it corrosive to certain mm. materials? So like you can. Say. Yeah. Yeah. OK, cool. I'm glad we're on the same page then. I like that idea. Because, yeah, you could do a couple things here. It would be more about the chemistry of their gear rather than the chemistry of Mm -hmm. the body. So even doing it so if they release a gas that will get sucked into the balloons, uh, into the flying balloons and cause a a spontaneous reaction, Mm -hmm. like that kind of thing, because then you just you release this gas. It mixes with what's what you know is in there and causes an explosion and the ship goes down. Um, Mm -hmm. it could potentially even be that like one of their, their last ditch defenses is potentially a weaponized form of the miasma. I was thinking that as an option as well. Mm. But I, I do like the idea of starting with the highly corrosive stuff to wear away the metals to then uh, in higher concentrations, like attack the gas supplies and and that kind of stuff in the ship. I don't know. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I like that idea. And um, yeah, culturally, I, I'd been looking at them as like very interested in science and medicine, um, mm. picturing a lot of like practicality in their society, uh, including clothes like gas masks and other protective gear. Mm-hmm. Um, you do love gas mask aesthetics. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I totally see that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then for a more mystical element, I wanted to include psychedelics as part nice. of their religion. Because uh, here on Earth, we've got the Colorado River toad that produces mm-hmm. a toxin that's psychoactive. And I wanted a similar kind of thing. Maybe even it's actually like toads to exist near my toad city or even mm-hmm. maybe in like poison caverns under the city uh, whose toxins are harvested for that use. And maybe that's like tying it back to our twist reconciliation, like a kind of way to communicate with the miasma or something like that. They do actually come from lava toads. <laughs> <laughs> like that's, yes. that's where they get their toxins is there's like there's lava tube caverns that are just filled with all of these different species of insects and toads. And uh, that, yeah. like that could legitimately be where they took the inspiration for their city and mm-hmm. then a lot of their initial poisons. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I like that. Question. 
I, what does this city look like? Cause I'm trying to think of like a, like a, a petroglyph of like a toad and stuff like that. And yeah. I just can't see it, you know, what would it like, look what like does that from look above? Like? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like I said, probably not the most attractive. I think the petroglyph itself is pretty simplistic and just this like giant fat toad creature. The outer lines of the petroglyph are mm. carved into the lava itself. So it has this like kind of red glowing outline. And then the city within, I'm picturing like kind of, I don't know, bulbous almost. Like um, mm. they sort of just add on to it over time and like slap on new, essentially like warts of sorts um, that are like new housing. So it is more of a three dimensional thing than just a like a line glyph, right? It looks like you're looking down on the back of like a bulbous warty toad. Is that kind of what you're? Yeah, I think originally like the original petroglyph was probably just carved into like a a mound or like a a small mountain. Um, but over time, it's been built up so that there's there are all these kind of extra shapes now, like additions onto it. Nice. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so we got apothecaries, we got toads, we've got mm -hmm. bulbous mm -hmm. cities. Like I, I, I'm, I'm digging it. <laughs> I'm really digging it. Uh, why don't we transition over to Clark then? Clark, what does your city look like? Tell us all about it. Okay, so I couldn't remember if we were supposed to have one or two prepared, and now I'm having a hard time picking between the two. All right, just go with the coolest one, obviously. Oh, mm -hmm. But they're but they're both. <laughs> uh, well, alternatively, I can go next if you want me to stall time for you. Yeah, That's why don't you go next? Well, well, okay, I, um, pick my favorite child. Okay, uh, we're yeah, we're gonna wait for Sophie's choice to play out on your end. Uh, okay, so here's what I've got going on. I decided that similar to Courtney, I wanted to focus a little bit on science and I wanted to think about how we can make certain things work. Like the idea of like the cities themselves, like controlling the winds or, or having like the winds play a big part in their construction really intrigued me. And so I bring you Noxtella, the city of stars and the petroglyph itself is in the shape of a seven pointed star. And they are massive spires. And what this ends up doing, it, it, the way that it's designed is that it creates this kind of spiral, like immediately upward. So it's an incredibly vertical city. And what ends up happening is you take your hot air balloon, you ride these trade winds spiraling upwards along the city, and you get at like one of the highest climate points that you can reach while, while also being safe. So what this allows is you get above cloud cover and you can study the stars and you can study mm, uh, cool. all sorts of cool and fun things, right? So they are astrologers and astronomers because I like the idea that those are both very important among the city and among the citizens. Mm -hmm. But there is kind of like a scientific viewpoint to it as well, where they're fascinated by this thing. And, and the other thing that I think is really interesting about this concept is you get flung upwards, but then there's a slow descent. Like it's kind of still once you get up there. And while that's great for studying stars, it's not really great for many other purposes, except it helps reorient people and like slowly descend in particular areas. So it's actually a really good reset point when you're traveling. Um, and that is my city culturally. Uh, again, I was interested in this idea that there are astrologers, astronomers, so there are kind of like dueling viewpoints in terms of science and mysticism. I, I don't want to mm -hmm. say like religion because that's certainly a part of it, but the mystic aspect is what I'm interested in as well. I really like that. And this is something Me that I meant to mention about um, Courtney's, but I like some of the wider implications. So like for Courtney, uh, if they, if the people in the Toad City wanted to send out supplies, just the nature of their setup, their ports have to be outside the city proper mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. yeah. all of their defenses work just as well against their own stuff as it does against other people's. Yeah, that's very yeah, true. Yeah, that's but really there, cool. There's some similar stuff with, with your tower, Rob, because if it's that tall, it's probably going to go across multiple atmospheric bands. Yes. Which means there's going to be parts of the year where they have to abandon entire swaths as the, as the dead winds come through. Ooh, yeah. uh, so it's like we have to abandon floors, whatever, through whatever. And um, everybody above, you're going to be cut off for three weeks. Know that and prepare. 
I like that. That's a lot. really interesting. Yeah, yeah that's a really agreed. great point, Clark. Yeah. Yeah, I love the idea or like the mental image of, you know, people notifying people on certain floors, like, look, in a couple weeks, you gotta move out of here as soon as possible, like pack up all your stuff. We've got places for you to stay down below. Uh, make sure you get everything. Don't leave your pets. Your undead pets, yeah, obviously. obviously. Yeah. And, and what I wanted to add with that is in addition to astronomy, they may also be one of the premier knowledge stores of meteorology. Mm-hmm. Damn it, planet. Clark, you stole my thunder because I was going <laughs> to say that exactly. Like, the, of course, they're the ones who are going to know when the dead winds are coming because they can literally see it better than anyone else. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm so glad we're on board there, Clark. A hundred percent. Yes. What else you got? What, what, what other stuff do we have? Is, is that it? Um, Did we just... So, I mean, we've talked about like lava and of course there's obsidian and other stuff that forms from that and maybe they use some sort of um volcanic glass to create telescopes so oh, that's fun better study yeah. things and like that could also have implications of like spying on what's going on elsewhere yeah or just keeping up to date with you know things going on in other parts of the world if they have these kind of high-tech ways of seeing what's going on i also love the visuals that come with that because if you did a telescope with obsidian everything is going to just have this smoky mm-hmm. cast to it which is mm-hmm. just super cool visually maybe i mean obviously this isn't scientific but like i like the idea that as they're using these lenses it's much easier to see stars because it's like kind of grayscaling out all of the non-star right. material yeah, yeah. right uh, but what you said, Courtney, is like that the idea that they're also spy masters or at least are, are deeply involved in that because their optic technology is so good. I absolutely adore that as well, mm. because it's like I, I, I love to think of like aphorisms and stuff like that when I'm describing cultures and cities, because I feel like once you start thinking about that, it, it really can create a mindset within its citizenry. Uh, and when I think of like telescopes up telescopes down something along that lines like when you're thinking of noxtella the city of stars you want their telescopes pointed up because that means that they're studying the stars if Mm -hmm. you have them pointed at you that means that something bad's about to happen you know like there's that kind of like cultural like aphorism uh, thing that i that i think is really fun and flavorful so yeah that's Mm -hmm. a really cool idea i I love the idea that they're spy masters now too 100 percent and there's so much that they could do with this city. And like, I don't know if this city of stars was initially was already there and it kind of just moved in or if it's something they built up. Um, if it's something that was already there, like if we had talked before about maybe having there be these uh, like ancient volcanic vents that are a amalgam of like obsidian and metal alloys and stuff like that. Maybe this is one of the like last standing ones and that's what it's built out of anyway. In that, like they can do all kinds of cool stuff where they are essentially building vertical levees mm-hmm. mm. so that they, they have gates and everything, um, gates entering, gates going vertically. So depending on what you want to do, like you're in communication with people and they put the right gates in the place so you can exit at the right altitude. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about this aesthetically and like seeing like. The, these kind of uh, gates that open and close and and allow you to like, you know, so you don't immediately rock it up towards the highest altitude. Like maybe there are uh, vents. Vents is the word I was looking mm-hmm. for. Yeah. Where you can like kind of control which which atmospheric level you want to travel to. Yeah. And that's a really cool idea as well. Yeah. Yeah. And they must have like a very interesting air traffic control kind of system. Yeah. Set up. Mm-hmm. Um, not sure how they would communicate over longer distances, but yeah. that's a pretty cool image too. And that is something to bear in mind anytime you're doing factions or cities or nations is they can have a primary focus, but they're never going to be one dimensional. Cause like, as we're right, building into right. this, there's more and more stuff that I'm like, the city would also be very useful as a trade hub. Mm-hmm. I don't want to make them also be like the trade city, but it's, they're undeniably useful for that. Yeah. You're absolutely right in saying that. I, I, I thank you for bringing up that point because I think it is it, it is something that uh, bad writing tends to focus on. Like you you have the idea of the monobiome, right? Where it's, this is the desert planet. This is the ice planet, you know, stuff like that. And you can easily slip into that with cities and cultures as well. It, it, especially in fantasy, you'll see this is elf city. 
this is dwarf city. Right. And like, that's right. kind of the monoculture that you see here. And I agree with you, Clark, 100% that just because we're highlighting these aspects of the city doesn't mean that that's all they are, because you're right. They're astronomers, astrologers, meteorologists, and spy masters. But mm -hmm. then you can look at that and use that to see how that influences their trade, how it influences their martial culture, how it influences mm -hmm. every other concept or aspect of life. And I love that because you should be using these uh, as, as starting points. How do these major cultural touchstones interact with the everyday mundanity that you then have to have these people live through every day or unlive through every day uh, in the city. And I think that's a great point to, to kind of focus on too. Mm -hmm. I say this all like every time we go about it, like initially it's, I don't know what's going to happen. And then five minutes later, this is cool. That's cool. Yeah. This is yeah. super cool. It's Cause it's all cool. <laughs> of course it is. The discovery is like the most exciting part about world building because it's, mm -hmm. you have these ideas and then the idea never lasts much longer until after you say it. We're, like my concept is, okay, I had this idea. And then immediately once I get your input, it lives entirely differently. Yeah. It's like, mm -hmm. again, one of my favorite, perhaps apocryphal quotes is everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. That's from Mike Tyson. <laughs> and it's a hundred percent true, right? Like you always have a plan until it, you know that plan hits the road and then it completely changes immediately. And, and that's the thing that I love mm -hmm. is like being able to roll with it yeah. and, and still get excited about how it changes because these are always just starting points for us. Yeah, yeah. And I do love how kind of the visuals evolve over time too and yeah. um, lead to some interesting contrast like just thinking about your city versus my city rob and how you've got this like beautiful like statue of david kind of thing going on like this magnificent tall uh model-esque kind of yeah. thing and i've got like frank reynolds or something <laughs> i i definitely see your city as more squat which i yeah, think is hilarious yeah, because exactly. that wasn't in your in, in implicit description right yeah it's just like no, you got like a little squat boy city going on. Yeah, it's like yeah. wide and bulbous and round. And like mine's like a spire that reaches towards the heavens. Of course, you know, like I love that kind of contrast. And it's yeah. and it's it's never like explicit. It's all things that we just kind of intuit from these descriptions. And I yeah. love, love, yeah. love how that works out. Mm -hmm. Something else that I would want to point out is that while the city of stars would seem like the powerhouse, right? Because of the nature of the setup that we have here, they would actually need to be very careful to keep the, uh, I, I'm just calling them the Toad Kingdom in my head, uh, <laughs> just to, to keep the Toad Kingdom happy because there's nobody better suited to take down the City of Stars than the Toad Kingdom. Oh, easily. Yeah, because yeah, they yeah. just bring their poisons, drop them at the base, and the winds do all of the work for exactly, them. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Like, <laughs> And that's, oh, that's that is an excellent point. Mm -hmm. All right, Clark, you've got to kill one of your children. Which one's going to be? Okay, well, I'm going to tell you what it is, uh, <laughs> so that I'm only halfway killing it. <laughs> okay. The idea was one that uh, like a a larger city that has guess been what we don't care. It's dead. Tell us about the real one. Fitted with pontoons, <laughs> so it can like float low over the ground. But anyway, the one that I'm keeping, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just calling them the Mirage Clan. Oh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. And they they inhabit their their actual city is at the very center of a uh, what we know like as the creators we know to be a spaceship graveyard mm -hmm. Ooh, okay. where there were yep. just whether it was battle spot or whatever there is debris and wreckage and shards just driving out of the earth but in the center there is a it was a ship that just went nose first and their city is a cross section of that ship. Mm. Cool. Okay. So it, it's very strange geometries that have clear mm. patterns and some symmetry. But if you don't know that that's what you're looking at, like cross sections of buildings and airplanes and stuff look very strange. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So there's that is just how their actual city works. And I was kind of picturing initially I was thinking of them just being scavengers um, and using the land to create like perception illusions and wind traps so that people that try and come into the graveyard get stranded, their their ships get down, and they can swoop in and take mm. the materials. I want them to have that, but I also think that they might be some of the main merchants because they might have 
one of the most prolific sources of alloys and polymers mm -hmm. in this entire continent. Yeah. I, I like that a lot. Me too. And yeah. the one other idea that I wanted to add, because I was using these, um, these creation cards I use when I'm stuck, was that they were initially very like scavenger-like and tricksters. Uh, like that was the whole thing is they would trick you into landing places that looked clear because the landing was clear, but what you didn't know is as you landed, you got swept up in a wind, which, you know, blew you straight into a wall of spikes. Um, <laughs> okay. Or, you know, just an area that would just tear your ship apart. But they ended up being bound or controlled by another clan. So they sort of had to step that back. And that's where they really stepped up as merchants instead. Interesting. I I think that I have a way that we can kind of square that if if you'll let me. Mm -hmm. Go for it. Okay. Uh, you're you're saying that they are deeply interested in scavenging and they have a, a major source of alloy and and you know this is a resource that is fairly hard to find otherwise. Correct. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Right. Mercantile areas are often areas that are hubs or easily accessible to many points of culture and communities. So why not have them be the gateway to this continent? So they're the ones who are interacting the most with the outside world. So whether or not you can add in something like they're the ones who ferry in and out the dead or in mostly the dead and you can still have all the other aspects. So when you say they're scavengers, you could literally have it so they're picking goods off of the dead bodies of the people who are bringing them in. And you can have the mercantile aspect as well because they're the ones like, yeah, alloys, no problem. We'll trade with that. Okay, and while we're doing that, we're going to pick up your dead and bring them back. How do you feel about that? Does that still fit within the concept that you're rolling with here? I, I actually love that because it makes them more than just a nation of reprobates, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Because doing it that way, yes, they were doing like mirage and trickery to crash ships and stall out armies and mm -hmm. uh, divert resources. But now that they are kind of the gateway, they are also, they're sort of guardians between the two worlds. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So... On one level, it's like, yeah, they're, they're tricksy and they will, you will go in and with an army and come out with 10 people, but they're there for a reason, which is why you just shouldn't tempt them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Another thing too, to think about is like the graveyard as an archive of sorts, like as somewhere where people can go to research technology and research, um, yeah. you know, any information that had been left on these ships. Yeah. Uh, almost like a giant library. I, I had almost thought of them as being kind of like guardians of these ancient artifacts too. Like mm -hmm. that's sort of the role that they, the mantle that they decided to pick up, but that could lead to some very interesting stuff as there could be, depending on how large the population is, there could be a sprawling network of cities just through the wreckage that is beneath the surface. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Cause especially since we know that they're now more in between the main deadlands and uh, we'll just living lands, I guess. They might be far enough away from from most of the lava and magma activity that their structures are are stable, and that could be part of the reason why they're they have the main resources. Other places, a lot of the metals mm -hmm. just get melted down and swept away in mm -hmm. the magma. Yeah, yeah, and the sand. Don't forget the sand. And the sand, sand too. That's true. <laughs> we should bring in more of the sand. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, it's fine. Uh, no, th this works out remarkably well, but. Uh, I can't help but think of the, the, I feel like our three cities work so well together that there, there's definitely like strong cultural identities. I have a very important question for you, Clark, and then I want to pivot over to something that we're missing and I think is important to talk about. So first, I'm going to ask you this question, Clark. What is the shape and symbol of the city of Mirage? Um, <laughs> I think it changes. Because are you familiar with um, labyrinths, like walking labyrinths, not not the mazes meant to keep people in, but where it's the winding path where you just keep following it until you get to the center, or even yes. actually just literal labyrinths. I think mm -hmm. their symbol, when they're passing out like coins and patches or things that are symbol of their people, is they are just these labyrinths that aren't all the same. Like if you if you stopped and looked at them, they would be different, but you look at them and instantly know, oh, they're the labyrinths. That's the Mirage clan. Mm. So it's it's like a, it's a shifting 
labyrinth. It's a shifting maze, essentially, right? I mean, it, it is static, but because it's so complex, it doesn't have a single shape, right? So people mm. will sort of draw it out into these labyrinths, um, but it's not completely accurate. It's not like a simple concentric circle mm. or a double helix or anything like that. With all of the rooms and everything, it's so complicated. More or less what it is, is any representation people try and make isn't correct. Mm -hmm. So you end up with multiple representations, but they're similar enough that people are like, oh, yeah, that's that's a mirage. And that could feed into the mystique, right, of <laughs> even their symbols aren't okay. consistent. I, th I think I've got an idea. So the general shape, like it doesn't change. You're right. You're absolutely correct. But General shape is a circle. <laughs> right. Culturally, what they do is they will like cover and uncover certain parts in like things within the city. So from yes. up top, it looks like it's shifting. So if you're a cartographer and you're trying to make a symbol and like you go in three months in and then like you sell your map and then some your client comes back pissed because now it looks completely different. And so yes. they're angry, but like below in the city itself, like it's, it's probably fairly stable. And I think yeah. that is so cool because it's literally a mirage. It's like an mm -hmm. optical illusion from that like kind of high point. I love that. Yeah. And that's something I forgot to mention was that part of their traps and stuff are masking things from above. Mm -hmm. yes. So so putting up large canopies and other things to make it look one way when it's really not. So they aren't yeah. necessarily changing the landscape. They're just changing how the landscape looks from above, which is where most people are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was thinking maybe sand can tie into this in a way, like they're shifting the sands. So Ooh. you cover things up and... Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so everything's still there, but you just can't quite see it the same. I mean, last time we talked about like cities funneling air currents and stuff like that. So that's what they do this time is that, okay, we're going to shift this yes. massive sand dune using yep. these vents mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Yeah. So that's partially how they conceal their city. That's a really great idea, Courtney. And it could also be pseudo seasonal, right? As the winds change, the sand is going to drift in different areas of the areas of the graveyard. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where if they're operating subterranean in this network between these uh, these crippled ships, they'll still be fine. But like on the surface, the landscape is significantly changing based on the mm -hmm. seasons and their own manipulations. Yeah, yes, I like that a lot. And yeah. this also all like the emphasis on seasons and the changing winds and stuff also kind of fits in with Rob, your city's interest in astrology. Like yeah. maybe they're so keen on it because of how important these things are. So like they associate certain months or seasons with certain traits because that's actually how it appears on the earth. Oh, are you telling me that there's going to be Leos and Sagittarii and Cancers and stuff like that? Like, is <laughs> oh, I, I mean, wait, I did this to myself because I already suggested that astrology is mm -hmm. an important aspect. Yes. Damn it. Yeah. Oh, damn it. You're absolutely right, Courtney. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. No, that's fine. That works. The, the other thing is actually each of each of these groups have multiple things that they focus on, right? The, the Toad Kingdom is defense and poisons, and alchemy, and probably synthetic material. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And then the City of Stars is astronomy, and meteorology, and, and spy network stuff. Uh, yeah. The Mirage Clan, scavenging, mercantile, and I think actually they might have the strongest military presence. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. they're, they need to. Because they're the ones right. who are defending the outside, yeah. Right, and that's part of what makes them even more terrifying is their army. Like their army is stronger, and then it's impossible to pin their army down. Like that's mm -hmm. a really bad combo. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. no, that's good. But of course, they're also. I, I would imagine that they're fairly vulnerable from the inside as well, because yes. while mm -hmm. they're you know their neighbors like know what to look for, know like the tricks well enough and stuff like that. So I think yeah. to outsiders, they're way more formidable than like the the other cities within the deadlands yeah yeah like i could even see um maybe at some point in the past my toad city had interacted with them and like if your mirage city was getting like too overboard with the theft and piracy the toads sent in like a bunch of hot air balloons that were just filled with the poison gas yeah and exploded them and were like you need to stop yeah. your shit because it's about sending a message. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Can you not? Anymore? You know yeah. what, I, what I love about the toad kingdom, the more we talk about it is we have some, there's so many themes of wind and air 
in this setting mm-hmm. that their focus on poison gases just melds smoothly into that mm-hmm. very much and so. yeah gives them kind of um almost almost like a, a power switch like or a mm-hmm. an extra lever because they they can do stuff they can manipulate the air and the winds because you're right the fact that the tower of stars has these wind currents going through them they just need to drop the poison in the right places and it goes yeah. through the city yeah same thing yeah. with the mirage kingdom they just make something that's heavier than air they mm. drop it and it will automatically funnel through the cracks down into the city they don't even have to hit the right place Mm-hmm. And because it's a labyrinth, like you can imagine this kind of like biblical cloud of miasma mm, yeah. roiling through it, you know, right. and because yeah. it's designed in such a shape, like it's going to hit everyone. Yeah, that's a good idea, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So they really are the toads. <laughs> they're, they're like, they're not pretty, but don't, don't, don't touch it. <laughs> just just let us sit here and do our science yeah. and do our like toad LSD right. and we'll leave you alone. <laughs> okay. Okay. I just imagined that you know what I can I, I can guess that uh, the city of stars gets a lot of tourism from the acid dropping toad people because they're gonna like <laughs> we're gonna take a balloon all the way up yeah. yes. and we're gonna watch the stars you know like mm-hmm. that would be really fun I would blow our minds yeah. exactly I'm also yeah. picturing people with like mini gliding suits. Oh, of course. Mm-hmm. Like that would be oh, a crazy nice. sport thing, right? You want to ride the channels all the way up to the stars. Oh, yeah. yeah. It wouldn't even just be about sports. It would be about like, hey, I want to be a courier. Like, how do I get information oh, up yeah. and down mm-hmm. quickly? Mm-hmm. You know, you just ride those currents up and down the tower. Yeah, hundred percent. Okay. Here is a blank space that we need to fill in because it's very important. And we literally didn't need to think about it until this episode. All of these folks are ferrying in the dead from elsewhere, right? Think about that. I feel like we need a city that is going to process the dead, that they are the city that essentially the the dead winds and the trade winds ritual happens in their city. I don't Mm. think it's something that is like uh, it happens everywhere. I I don't think that's the case. I think that these bodies come in, they're processed at a certain point within the continent, within the region. And then those dead folks end up spreading out to whichever city they find to be most, you know, Mm -hmm. it's you, this is like, this is like tutorial land in an MMO. And then you're like, oh, I want to go to this city because I think it's cooler. I think this vibe works better for me. But it's like basically where you wake up as an undead. You know, it's very, it's very different. It's like a hodgepodge of a bunch of different places. But I think that it's going to be a lot more deeply religious as well. And I okay. think that's definitely a place that we need to introduce. And obviously we don't have to have just four cities, but I think that something like this is important to have because it's uh, it, that aspect now plays a very important uh, part in the culture that we've created. I, I had initially thought that the, the rights or the, um, the separating of the essences would happen like at the time of death, wherever they died. Mm-hmm. And then the remaining, the reanimated dead, we're literally just waiting for the dead ships to come by. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, yeah. See, I had it as they would literally take the dead bodies and then process them in these lands. So, you know, we could do both. The nearby lands ship their dead because they're close enough. Yeah. yeah. But ones that are further away, they have to do the rites on their own and then they have to live with the dead until the yearly passage of the ships. Mm-hmm. That works. Yeah. 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 Maybe there are like essentially undead priests that travel to those cities to mm. kind of do those rites outside. Yeah. Yeah, that works. Anyway, I, I do love the idea of the city. Um, I think we I think we can do both just based on distance from the deadlands. Sure. Why not? I'm I'm down. I'm hundred percent down. Yeah. Yeah. I like the idea of having like a maybe not even something that started as a city, but over time built into one where each kind of group within the deadlands had contributed different technologies or knowledge mm-hmm. um to create this like sort of priests cathedral kind of thing and that's where Mm. it all happens so like the toads are bringing in like i don't know the poisons and yeah their their knowledge of that and yeah yeah no i i'm really digging the idea of the starter cities right because there could be more than one like all around the realm of the deadlands Mm -hmm. and they have representatives of all of the major cities because this is your trial area so here's one of (laughs) one of being a remaining and uh here are the different factions so Test out your skills, see which path you want to take. Oh and if God, you yeah. want to be a poisoner, you need to come here. 
if you want to stare up at the sky, you oh need my, to go here. You're literally choosing your advanced class. Oh yes. my god, you're so right. Yeah. I think we just made the next MMO, guys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, we need billions of dollars. Yeah. If we're gonna make it. To, or not billions, but you know, millions upon millions. But mm-hmm. yeah. What 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 I like about that? I, I want to go back to this idea that you're creating like culture upon culture. It reminds me a lot of the um, Hagia Sophia which was originally like a Eastern Orthodox Byzantine church that was then later converted into a mosque. Like I like the idea that that process never stopped happening. So it's like now a mixture of every religion mm-hmm. and it has like yeah. these elements of, you know, you'll, you'll have all of these different cultural elements depending on the different religions of the world. And they're all built into this one massive faith superstructure, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, I love that. They could even just be called the Church of the One and their Mm -hmm. priests are just, their Mm -hmm. shawls are just covered in all of the religious symbols from across the world so that wherever you came from, there is something familiar. Alternatively, I I have this idea that you just have a bunch of religious like gangs made up of teenage boys or undead (laughs) teenage boys, I guess, where they're like, you know, like it's it's like religious warfare, but like on a block to block level, <laughs> you know, and, and it's like not really serious. But like, I think that there's some kind of like cheeky fun that you could kind of have with that, you know. <laughs> um, all right, man, we've been going. We've been going for a while now. I love this. This concept, this setting is so cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, we need to come up with a main quest. Uh, if we don't have any immediate ideas that spring to mind, I'm going to roll some dice. So unless someone has an idea, let me get those dice. I do have an idea. Ooh. Clark, hit us. Go ahead. So I am for for adventures. I am always big on a mystery hook. Mm-hmm. So I really like the idea that there is there's a clan, there's a city that has gone silent. And all that is coming out of there are the uh, like ravenous miasma infected remaining Mm -hmm. Uh, and like what could be going on there could be a special agglomeration or even a new evolution of the miasma that that's Mm -hmm. like the big bad that they have to deal with Mm -hmm. that's great how do we tie in each of the other factions now um my initial uh, my initial idea is that this is actually a toad city experiment gone wrong (laughs) <laughs> but you know like they're like oh we were trying and like it doesn't have to be a bad thing right like it can totally right. be like hey we were trying to figure out a way where we can like control the dead winds better or like d- you know dis- dissolve the dead winds so they're not as intense and angry you know but yeah. then somehow the opposite happened and now like yeah. this miasma is like thicker and not moving away <laughs> from this particular city or something right like that. right yeah. oh ooh, okay um why don't we have it be in Noxtella and have it so that cloud is not moving and it's like causing a separation between uh, the two, like the up and the down parts uh, of the city. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, they're normally like provisioned to do with like maybe three weeks to a month maximum mm-hmm. of being able to be separated from the two different areas. Right. But right. now it's two months and things are starting to get desperate. And yeah. You know, like, so you're, you're trying to figure, they're trying desperately to figure out a way to dissipate this miasma that they inevitably find out is the Toad Clan's fault, right? Wow. Uh, yeah. Not, not on purpose, right? So they'll, so they'll take that into some consideration mm-hmm. when mm-hmm. they ask for reparations, but we now, <laughs> we now have to look to the Mirage. What are the Mirage city contributing to this adventure? And we can go from there. I, Cause I think that's a banger of an idea, but Hey, who am I? I guess, how could the Mirage kingdom be part of the solution or worst case scenario? The Mirage kingdom can always just be the origin. Mm-hmm. Like they sabotaged the toad kingdom. Oh experiment yeah. Or something. Yep. yep oh, yep. I, I was okay. more thinking like if you were telling an adventure, it may be that all of the heroes just start in the Mirage kingdom. Oh, I gotcha. Yeah. And you come up with some other reason why they have to go across and get swept away in the larger plot. Uh, mm-hmm. Like if we really couldn't think of a way to be like the Mirage Kingdom is is intimately connected with the solution. Okay, but what if we did Courtney's thing? <laughs> yes, let's do Because I, I like the idea that the Mirage uh, City is starting shit, you know? Like, yeah, or it could even be like a, a sub-faction, like some pirate group yeah, yeah, that's yeah. bent on creating chaos. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because I think that's a really fun idea. I think that we can have 
you know, a little bit of both. And like you said, Clark, if we're starting this as a mystery, then we can have it be so the uh, the Toad Clan are the obvious red herring, only to find out that the true uh, originators of this plot are the Mirage City, you know? Mm-hmm. How's that work out? Does that work out? I think that works out a little bit, but you tell me. No, I, I like that. I like that. I'm just uh, thinking through some things. You're trying to make the Mirage Clan not look like dickheads, complete dickheads, rather? <laughs> we can just keep passing the blame. No. No, yeah, that's, sure. Like, every, everybody has everybody has a little bit uh, yeah. going here. Like that's usually yeah. how it works. It's, it's a yes. series of mistakes. It's not just one. No, right, right. <laughs> it's not mm-hmm. just one thing. I would like to blame the astrologers or the mystics within the city of stars. <laughs> uh, I think that they they would you know like they allowed something. They they are very permissive of like breaking a city ordinance to prevent this exact thing from happening or mm-hmm. something similar to that. Because I think that would be fun that you play between like the astrologer sides of the city are very chaotic and the uh, the astronomer side of the city are very lawful. You know, if we're talking mm-hmm. about alignment. So let me know if this is too complicated. But what if the different groups were pursuing research in different things and then it was somehow these got merged and that's what caused the problem? Mm. In, in so, what way? It, it, it express that a little bit differently. So if the if the Toad Kingdom was trying to deal with like I, I'm thinking either they they already have pseudo weaponized miasma they might have a theory of like well we do have remaining who have more bad in them than good so what if we can reattach what if we can purify the miasma a little bit and reattach it to bodies and give it another chance to fix itself mm. Mm. and that could lead to the portion where it's possessing people. Yeah. Um, and the the Mirage Kingdom, and this is going to be me uh, sneakily putting in the other one that I wanted to do. The Burden <laughs> City, <laughs> the idea I had is that they they would incorporate themselves into the city and become a living city. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe the Mirage Kingdom is trying to figure out a way to do that so that they can improve their internal defenses, right? Actually build their people mm-hmm. into the structure. Interesting. Okay. And so that kind of combination with something that the City of Stars is doing is why when this fabricated cloud drifts by, it latches onto the structure and stays there. And Mm -hmm. it starts Mm -hmm. infecting and uh, changing anybody that comes nearby or gets caught Mm -hmm. inside. That adds an additional element to it that is also really interesting because now you have a plague element, which is always interesting, except this time it's like, you're you're taking regular undead and turning them feral, essentially, yeah. right? That's what you're suggesting. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have the verticality of that too. So it's like, okay, think of train to Busan and now <laughs> flip it to and now it's a tower instead of a long ass bullet train, you know, like that type of thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Do we want to come up with a solution or at least spitball ideas for a solution? Because I'd like to. I mean, like what what would be the way to dissipate this miasma? I mean, I, I do want to keep in mind the themes from the original prompt uh, that were adventure, community, love, and nature. Love so, is something that we haven't touched upon at all. So yeah, that's yeah. a very good point, Courtney. So maybe something having to do with like, I don't know, something there that can like pacify this plague storm that's occurring, mm-hmm. but I'm not sure how to make it work. So what if, what if there is a single, we, we've kind of talked about this hive mind. Right. Right. In the past with some of the miasma forming into these larger creatures. Mm -hmm. What if there is a stronger singular identity? And this is getting um, very, very esoteric. But if I was writing a novel, the interesting twist there might be they have to journey through the miasma. They get to this core. And if I wanted the theme to be like love and forgiveness, Mm -hmm. then it is about reconciling and making peace with that inner personality so that it will then let go of its hold and everything can drift apart. Yes. I I love that idea. Me too. I I, want to add like a little bit of a twist on it, right? So we have a central figure who is the main reason for this miasma sticking around, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. How about the heroes recognize that the only way to dissipate that is to find that person's loved one? The only mm. problem is that that person's spirit lies within one of these conglomerates. So you have this amazing moment where the heroes are riding on the backs of this giant behemoth, like skeleton, 
towards mm-hmm. the city and to the to the city of stars it's like oh we're under attack you know yeah. like there's this like threatening moment only for them to be reconciled and then that is you know like maybe now that skeleton is like a permanent fixture among the city of stars so there's like a behemoth mm-hmm. skeleton wrapped around parts of the city a giant a giant boa oh yeah it's sure. just coiled around image. the city yeah 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 okay I'm, I'm down i'm down i'm 100 percent down so yeah there we go so like you see like a giant bone serpent wrapped around the central spire within the city and like right where the head is is where that initial like figure was and so they like reconvene and they they fall back in love and then that's when the miasma dissipates again Mm -hmm. and what i what i love about this what i love 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 about this is one it is going to change their perception of the world because at the end of this adventure there is now solid proof of the entity like the miasma minds Mm -hmm. can be reconciled and Mm -hmm. can be Mm -hmm. made whole yes they aren't irredeemable. They aren't completely lost. And you also have the whole thing of anything anything good taken too far or pushed in the wrong way can be poisoned. Because mm-hmm. it was like this one yes. person, it might, might be bitterness and revenge. And they had to see that there's another, there's an aspect of this person they love is still there. And that's what lets them let go. All of this emotional resonance in the way that is going to change the world and how they see things. I love it. Yeah, and, and of course, there's also the inter conflict, or the intra, inter or intra. There's now conflict between the cities, right? Like, like I was kind of like half joking before. I can see the city of stars asking for reparations from those who are yeah, there's a perceived yeah. wrong. So mm-hmm. there's a cultural shift as well. Like there is the scientific side that you're kind of suggesting, Clark, where it's like, oh, there's so many implications with this. But then, like. Yeah, 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 yeah. We need some compensation for this attack on our city. You mm-hmm. know, like there, there's like so many different elements that this this adventure kind of brings up and out in this particular area. That's so fucking cool. We fucking right. nailed it, y'all. <laughs> it's so good. Ah, oh, okay. I think that's it. I think we're good, right? Like we nailed it. Oh, it's so good. Yeah, yeah, I love this. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. So, so, so we're good. Uh, again, a big thanks to Axel for bringing us the the sky of a thousand trade winds. The 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 twist ended up really working out and like adding this beautiful yeah. like sauce that you just draw. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> okay, you know what we need to do? We need to sell this to um, what is it? The people who do Dark Souls. This is just another perfect Dark Souls from style. software. I could picture <laughs> this software. as being yeah. Oh, easily. In that style. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, very, very much so. It'd be a very different, it's, it'd be a departure for sure compared to what they've done before. But but still, uh, remember, if you want us to build your world, if you want us to add some sauce to your concepts, by all means, go right ahead. Go to worldbuildwithus.com, click on the link, follow the instructions, and within a reasonable amount of time, we'll be building your world. If you want to follow us on social media, we're at Let's World Build. You can go there, click on the follow, click on the likes, give us the good dopamine rush. If you want to come talk to us about the undead in our Discord, there's a link for that in the description. And if you loved this so much, you're like, you know what? You gave me a million plot hook ideas. You gave me my next area that my adventurers are going through. And you want to show us some love? Go to our Patreon give us some money. You get extra bonus stuff to it too. You get, you know, patron only episodes. It's good. Click on the link. It's in the description. That's good too. That's totally fine. If you don't, that's cool. I mean, you're listening. We're we're, we're here to love you. Anyway, that'll do it for this episode of World Build With Us. Remember that we love you very much and we're going to get through this together until next week.